can, just wherever you are, just stand to your feet. We'll be dismissing the children at this time. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. I'm so glad to see you in the house of the Lord today. Before you pick up your Bible, what I will ask you to do is we have uh, this uh, huge event coming up uh, next Tuesday. Not this Tuesday, but the following Tuesday. It's a huge event. Uh, one year, I believe it was last year, we estimated the attendance to be about 3,000 people. They actually were parked all the way up into the DSS parking lot in front of the thrift store, all in front of the church. And uh, there were a lot of people here on that evening. So we need as many volunteers as possible. <clears throat> the reason I ask you don't pick up your Bible right now is because I want you to, if you are interested in serving, if you are interested in helping, and if you just want to be available, because I believe that the greatest ability is availability. Amen. And I believe that the greatest disability is a bad attitude. Amen. But uh, what I want you to do is I want you to text the word harvest. I want you to grab your phones and I want you to text. If you want to serve in this event, if you want to help, if you want to participate, I want you to text the word harvest to 313131. The word harvest to 313131. And then after that, we'll be in touch with you and we'll get you connected. We'll get you plugged in so you can help uh, serve in this particular event. Because for me, it's about souls. Hallelujah. Uh, for me, it's about getting people to come out of darkness into the kingdom of light. And uh, for them to turn their back on the world, the sin, and the devil. And for people to live for the Lord with all their heart. But a lot of people, they won't attend church. Uh, but they will come for some candy. So the candy is just bait. Amen. The candy is just bait. I think last year we had about 800 pounds of candy. I think this year we have about 500, but candy is 500 pounds. But more candy is coming in. But it's just bait because we want to win the lost. Amen. With the glorious gospel of the kingdom. So we'll bring them in here in groups of 300, 350, 400. And we'll share the gospel with them before they even get a tootsie roll. So continue to keep that in prayer that, that God be glorified and that souls will be drawn unto him. The word of God teaches us that if he be lifted up, he'll draw all men unto himself. Hallelujah. So if you can text that to me, uh, it actually go to a system which I have access to. Text that and we'll have somebody touch base with you. And also to my wife, my lovely wife, my gorgeous wife, my sweet wife, my awesome, I'm, I'm, I'm getting some points here, y'all. <clears throat> but she'll be in the lobby, guys, and she will be taking names. So if you want to, uh, if you're old school, if you don't have a smartphone, maybe you, maybe you still haven't been delivered from a dumb phone, maybe you're still in a dumb phone state, that's okay. But uh, we'll, we'll get you out there in the lobby. You can sign up if you're old school, and we'll get you information. We'll, we'll connect with you and, and then show you how you can serve. She'll be in the lobby at the next steps booth. Are you excited to be in God's house today? Are you hungry for the word of the Lord? Hallelujah. I want you to grab your Bible and I want you to go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And there is a word from heaven for the house today. And uh, I don't want you to get mad at me today. Amen. I just, I just believe that I'm the mailman. You can't get mad at the mailman for delivering the mail. Uh, you got to get, get mad at the person that, that the mail has come from. And the thing about it is, is if the mail is coming from the Lord, it doesn't do you any good to get mad at God because you can't get mad at your help. Amen. Uh, it doesn't make sense for you to get mad at your help. Uh, David said, my help comes from the Lord who, made, who has made heaven and earth. And while you're flipping there, there's a lot of exciting things going on with the ministry. We actually have the privilege of being at uh, Tiger River Correctional Institution this past Tuesday, uh, Pastor Jeremy and I. And uh, we will be launching the Bible school officially in Tiger River Correctional Institution starting in January. Somebody shout hallelujah. Amen. And for those of you who are not here, uh, not this past Wednesday, but the Wednesday before that, uh, Apostle Safi was here. He brought a powerful word, a man of God. He's from Guyana. And uh, we're going to actually be able to equip him with the school of ministry. He's excited about it. He wants to take it back. Uh, I think he's pastoring about, I think he's over about 13 different churches. And uh, he wants to take it into Suriname uh, and uh, some other areas around him, uh, the Bible school that we're going to give him before he gets on a plane Tuesday. So y'all keep that in prayer. I mean, God is, God is up to something great. Hallelujah. He is up to something great. And for those of you who are still uh, <clears throat> deliberating whether or not you should get into the Bible school, <clears throat> if you have any questions, uh, please be sure to see Miss Cindy. As my wife said, we'll start the first Tuesday of November and getting in God's word and helping you mature in the things of the Lord and uh, training you uh, for the work of the kingdom. The Bible says uh, that uh, there was given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the equipment of the saints and for the work of the ministry. Amen. Uh, you don't come to church just to look cute. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You come to get equipped. You come to get equipped. 
I know some of you have came looking for your Boaz today, but uh, you might have came for that reason, but we believe in equipping people here at this church. Hallelujah. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, look at your neighbor and say, Pastor Dunn says, Pastor Dunn said, don't get mad at him over this word today. It's not from him. It's going to be from the Lord. So receive it and be blessed. All right. Follow along with me as I read. I had one passage I was going to just pick out of here, but everything's so good. I'm just going to start right here in verse 1. If you have it, shall I have it? I have it. And this is the Apostle Paul, and he's writing to Timothy, his protege. And he says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick or the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Amen. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned into fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Do thy diligence to come unto me shortly, for Demas has forsaken me, loving this present world, and has departed unto Thessalonica, Christians to Galatia, Titus to the Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. I'm going to stop right there. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I love you with all my heart. I adore you. I exalt you, Lord God. I praise you, Lord. I thank you that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. I thank you, Lord God, that in you there is hope, Lord. And God, I've discovered, Lord, that three things everybody needs. That's food, that's air, and that's hope, God. And you give us hope, Lord. You give hope to the hopeless. For you're the father to the fatherless. Father, you are the husband. Uh, to, the, to, 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 the, to, to the husbandless God. You are the one, Lord, who is the lifter of our head. So today, God, teach us, instruct us, challenge us, God, and let your word, God, fall upon good ground to bring forth 60 and even 100-fold return. In Jesus' name we pray. And if you're in agreement, shout amen. amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. The Apostle Paul goes on to say in this passage, he says, you know, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. And then he says, there was no man that stood with me, but all men forsook me. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. For those of you who don't know who the Apostle Paul is, the Bible says that this was a man who actually, his name was Saul before he had a, before he had a radical conversion in Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 7, it was Saul of Tarsus who was consenting to the death of Stephen when Stephen was stoned to death. The Bible says that Stephen looked up and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God, the Father. How many of you know that the anointing oftentimes will get you in trouble? It oftentimes gets you in trouble, even at the point of your life at times. You know, some people have made the mistake of saying that in the center of God's perfect will is the safest place. But oftentimes that's not true. Uh, sometimes being in the center of God's perfect will is often the most dangerous place to be. If you look at the people in the Bible, you look at the people, look at their lives, uh, the uh, only one that had a natural death out of the apostles was John. The rest of them, they were martyred, they were killed uh, for the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that they loved not their lives unto the death. In other words, they were relentless. They were, they, were, they were people of passion. They loved the Lord in so much that they had no compromises in their lives. They were willing to step out on faith and do great things for the Lord. But the Apostle Paul, he stands out to me in Scripture because he's one of the greatest testimonies and one of the greatest miracles in all the Bible. He was an antagonist. 
He was, a, he was somebody who was a, a persecutor of Christians. He, he opposed them on every side. The Bible says in Acts chapter 9 that he was actually on his way to imprison Christ, uh, Christians. He was actually on the way to kill Christians, but he had a radical conversion where he was knocked off of his horse and literally God knocked the, he knocked the S off his name and he said, your name shall no longer be called Saul, but your name shall be called Paul. Isn't it interesting how when you have an encounter with God, uh, it's, it's clear that all things have passed away, behold, all things become new. And not only that, he'll give you a new name. Amen. He'll give you a new heart. In the book of Ezekiel, he says he pulls out the stony heart and he'll give you a heart of flesh. But the apostle Paul, he's interesting because immediately after he had his conversion, after that, after he was knocked off of his horse, three days he was in blindness and he didn't eat and he didn't drink. But Ananias went to him and he laid hands on him and the scales came off of his eyes. And from that point forward, he became one of the most outspoken people for Christendom, for the kingdom. He, he was so bold and courageous. The Bible says that he was causing so much havoc and devastation on the kingdom of darkness that there was men that took an oath that they wouldn't eat and they wouldn't drink until they killed the apostle Paul. He was looked for. He was hunted down. The Bible says that he had to be let down a, the window in a basket because they wanted to kill him. Uh, the Bible says that he was locked up and that he was in chains. Agabus took his cloak and he said that, that, that this man, this, this man, the apostle Paul, he should be going to prison. And the apostle Paul said, he said, I'm ready to even go to prison and I'm ready to even die for the Lord Jesus. He was a scholar of scholars. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. The Bible says that he was circumcised on the eighth day. He had a pedigree. He, he sat at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the prestigious rabbis of the day. So he was a very astute man. He was, he was an educated man. He, he, uh, he argued with the Stoics. He argued with the Epicureans. He argued on Mars Hills with, with the Athenians. He, he was somebody who, was, uh, who, who could debate with philosophers. He would use their ideologies and be able to testify about Christ to them. He said this is, they had a plaque one time about to the unknown God and he took that as a launching pad and he preached Christ and the resurrection to those. He was articulate. He was a literary genius. In fact, we still find comfort in his words. Even for instance, like in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where he says that though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels and have not love, I have become just a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy, so I understand all men's mysteries. And though I have the gift of faith, so I say unto this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea. And he, he goes and he talks about love, but he, he was articulate. He, he in, in Romans chapter 1, a theological uh, a patchwork that even the most astute and the most biblically astound scholars even today still haven't even escaped even the surface of, of the book of Romans because it's so profound in his treaties and the way that he presents the gospel. In, in chapter 1 he talks about the Gentiles being lost. In chapter 2 he talks about the Jews being lost. In chapter 3 he says the whole world is lost. There's no one righteous. No not one. In chapter 4 he talks about Abraham's faith. In chapter 5 he says that we have peace with God. In chapter 6 he says that we wrestle with the, he says, talks about the flesh and talks about the issues that you have in the flesh and he gets into sanctification. You get to chapter 7 and he says, oh wretched man that I am. He gets to chapter 8 and he says that there now is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus who walk according to the spirit and not after the flesh. You get to chapter 9, he talks about Israel's past. In chapter 10, he talks about Israel's present. In chapter 11, he talks about Israel's future. In Romans chapter 12, he says that this, he says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind and don't conform to this world. He was a literary genius. In chapter 13, he talks about authority. Chapter 14, he talks about the conscience. Chapter 15, he talks about those, they that are strong, edify those that are weak. So he was an individual that would take people and he would raise them up. Anybody he touched, he would raise them up. He had such an anointing upon his life. He wrote 14 books of the New Testament. He traveled over, over 10,000 miles. But listen, as he is journeying along life, he gets to this place in 2 Timothy. And this is actually one of the last letters that he will write. He, he's in a place, and listen, he's not writing from a seminary. He's not writing sitting at the Marriott. He's not at the Billy Graham Training Center. This brother, he is in a wet and a damp and a dark prison. And here he is. He's stuck like Chuck. Listen, not because he's done anything wrong, but because he's done everything right. And here he is. He's speaking to his protege. He's speaking to somebody who is supposed to carry on his legacy. And he's talking to Timothy, and he tells Timothy here in the scriptures, because Timothy was somebody who was a son of the faith. Timothy had a, he had an unusual uh, 
pedigree because his father was a Greek and his mother was a Jew. His mother was his mother was uh, his grandmother was Eunice and his mother was Lewis, Lois. And but they spoke into Timothy's life and God and, and God used Paul the apostle to grab Timothy and begin to raise him up in the faith and to be, begin to mentor him and mature him. And Timothy followed the apostle Paul everywhere he went and he, and he spoke life over him. But here he is and he's writing Timothy in this in this particular letter and what he begins to tell him he says look he says God has not given you a spirit of fear but a power and a love and a sound mind see because the apostle Paul he knows something about being a seasoned minister of the gospel of the kingdom he knows something about life see the thing about it is, is there's two ways to success two easy ways to a success and number one the, the number one is is, is is a teacher amen having a mentor having somebody that can speak into your life and that's the best way to success because listen experience is not the best teacher a lot of people they try to learn by experience I ain't got to put my hand on a stove to know that it's hot. I can watch you burn your hand. I ain't got to go to the penitentiary to know that I don't want to go to the penitentiary. Uh, there's some things I don't have to do but, but the apostle Paul, he began to speak into Timothy's life and he began to say God has not given you a spirit of fear but a power and a love and a sound mind because Timothy was a young man and what the apostle wanted to do is he wanted to prepare him for life. He wanted to prepare him for ministry. He wanted to prepare him to be an effectual steward in the hands of God and what I love about the apostle Paul's approach is he really truthfully wanted to convey to Timothy that just because you're saved and just because that you're called and just because you're ordained doesn't mean that you're going to be exempt from trials and tribulations. Doesn't mean that, that, that things in life are not going to happen. Doesn't mean that you're not going to be without afflictions. It doesn't mean that you're not going to be without persecution. Even Jesus Christ himself in this world you will have trouble but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Come on, y'all need to clap your hands up in this place. I believe this is a good word. So he begins to warn the young man out of his own experience. Because the Bible says that he had been shipwrecked. The Bible says that he had been beaten with rods. The Apostle Paul, he had been beaten with rods. The Bible says that he was persecuted by, 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 by brethren and by false, bro by false brethren. The Bible says that he, he, he went to Malta and he was bit by a serpent. I mean, every time the brother was turning around, either he was getting locked up or he was getting beaten or something was happening to him. And he wanted, to, uh, he wanted Timothy to know that, that, listen, just because you're saved, you're just not going to have houses you didn't build and wells you didn't dig and vineyards you didn't plant. Doesn't mean that you always going to be feel like you're blessing the city and blessing the store and blessing you going in and blessing you coming out. That you're going to be the head and not the tail. He was trying to give Timothy a proper picture of what it was like of being a Christian. And basically, what he was trying to convey to him, which I want you to walk away with today, is basically: listen, you need to learn how to endure hardships like a good soldier. You need to learn how to endure hardship like a good soldier. See, because the Apostle Paul, he wrote the handbook on spiritual warfare in the book of Ephesians. He knew that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. He knew how to fight the good fight of faith. He knew how to beat his body and put it under subjection lest when he preached to others, he would be considered a castaway. He knew all that about the things of the kingdom. But listen, one thing he knew is what all good fighters know is that it does not matter how good you can throw the blows. If you don't know how to take a blow, then you can't be in the fight. See, I don't care if you can throw your fist. I don't care if you can do a two-piece with a, with, a, with a chicken dinner. I don't know. I, I, listen, listen. What I want you to understand is that if you can't take a blow, if you can't take a hit, listen, then you ain't ready for the fight. You ain't ready to get into the ring. See, what I've discovered about Christians is that when, 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 when life is going good, when, when the money is flowing, when, when you're getting promotions on your job, when your kids are acting right, when everything is going the way that you think that things should go, then you are all right with Jesus. But when the life starts to hit you, and when trials start to hit you, and when troubles start to hit you, you begin to fold, and you begin to buckle. And what I've come here to tell you today is that you need to learn to endure hardness like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. The actual Greek construction is actually, listen, it's actually take your part of the suffering. In other words, it's inevitable. It's going to happen. See, 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 I've discovered this in Scripture. I've discovered this in Scripture. It's a common pattern throughout Scripture. Listen, listen, listen. Jesus, when he gets a hold of a person, you might start out like a pansy-wansy, limp-wristed, spaghetti-spine person. But by the time Jesus gets done with you, you, you have a rod. You, your, your, your spine will be like a rod of iron. You'll be able to take a licking and keep on ticking. You remember Gideon? He found him in the wine press, threshing the wheat. 
but by the time he got done with Gideon, Gideon was a mighty man of God. But what I love about God, what he does is he takes people and he radically changes their lives. But listen, well, the reason why people don't really come into fruition, uh, some people don't come into fruition, is because when trials hit them, they begin to buckle and they turn their back on God and they walk away. Listen, listen, listen very, very carefully. This is what God told Jeremiah. He told Jeremiah, he said, if you can't run with horsemen, how will you? He said, if you can't run with footmen, how will you run with horsemen? He said, in other words, if, if, if you're in this place right now and this little stuff is causing you to buckle, if this little stuff is causing you to fold, what you going to do when I put you in the real fight? What you going to do when I put you in the real struggle? What you going to do? Well, what you going to do when people you love and people you invest in and people you pray for and the people you bend your back over with, for they turn around and they leave you like Damas forsook the Apostle Paul. I want somebody to get this in their spirit today. I'm not here to tell you that, 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 that listen, I'm not here to tell you that everything is going to be peaches and cream. There are a lot of churches in Spartanburg that will tell you that. I'm telling you today what Jesus said. In this world, you will have tribulation. I'm, I'm here to tell you what the Apostle Peter said. Consider it not strange about the fiery trial that's about to try you. I'm here to tell you today, you've got to get to the place where you look like Job and you say, though he may slay me, Lord, I'll still trust in you. Come on, tear the roof off this place and give God some good heart to the Holy Ghost. See, he was, he was encouraging Timothy. He was, he was, he was edifying Timothy. He told Timothy, he said, let no man despise your youth. He said, you're going to have older people, Timothy, that's going to come and try to tell you to do it this way or tell you to do it that way. He said, but God has called you, Timothy. And if you just fan that gift on the inside of you, if you begin to fan that flame on the inside of you, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. And God didn't make a mistake in choosing you. He didn't look at and choose you because your age. He didn't choose you because who you were. He chose you because who you were not. He took you because who you were not. And he's made somebody great out of you. Listen to me, Timothy. You are going to have trials. You are going to have troubles. If you've been called to preach the gospel, baby, I'm telling you, it ain't always easy. I'm telling you, sometimes you, listen, sometimes things hit you like no one hit anybody else because you've been called to preach, because you've been called to teach, because you've been called to minister the things of the kingdom of God. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. But he wanted to encourage Timothy. See, sometimes we need the encouragement before we go through the fire. He wanted to encourage him, and then he wanted to warn him. Warn him. He wanted to warn him. See, the apostle knew something about walking with the Lord. This thing about Damas, it really just stands out to me in Scripture. Because the apostle Paul, he loved Damas. He loved Damas. There was no doubt about it. There were cohorts. There were constituents. They, 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 were, they were colleagues. They were counterparts in the ministry. They were doing great things. Signs, wonders, miracles were taking place. They, 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 they had a common destiny. They had a common future. And then the Apostle Paul, he, he cries out. This is his last letter. And he cries out and he says, Damas has forsaken me. Having loved this present world. See, I honestly believe that one of the most painful things in being in the kingdom it's really not the persecution that we have that comes from people that don't really like us anyway. It's, the, it's, it's really the attack that comes from the one that we sit together and we drink coffees together and we kiki and we kaka together and we, we hang out together and we fist bump and we high five and we cry on each other's shoulders and we, and, and we hug each other and we walk through different trials and tribulations through life. And then one day you look up and they're gone. I believe that's more painful than getting beat with rods. I believe that's more painful than getting a shipwreck. I, come on somebody. Somebody needs to talk back to me in this place. I, I believe that's more painful. Then all those things that he enumerates there in 2 Chronicles, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I believe it's more painful. And this is what the Apostle Paul is trying to tell Timothy. He's telling him to endure hardness. In other words, man up. In other words, gird up your loins. Isn't that what God told Job? Pull up your britches, boy. Be a man. That's what he told him. Do you know Joshua? In the book of Joshua, he was crying out to the Lord. He was praying to the Lord. God looks at Joshua 
And he says, why are you even praying? Amen. He said, get up. Amen. He said, go deal with the sin of the camp. Yeah. Can you imagine God telling you not to pray? Amen. In other words, why are you bumping your gums? Be a man. Deal with the situations Amen. that's going around, going on. Samuel was the same way. He cried out because, because uh, Saul had been rejected as king. And, and, and God told, he told the prophet Samuel, he said, how long are you going to be on your face before me? He said, get up and rise and go anoint somebody else. I, I've rejected Saul and I've chosen another better than him. I believe the word for the house is man up. I believe the word for the house today is endure hardness. Stop crying about your finances. Stop stop sniffling about your marriage. Stop saying, get over some stuff. Stop being so upset because somebody took your seat at church last week. Are you gonna get listen, listen, who cares what your mama says? Who cares what your brothers are saying about you? Who cares what your sisters are saying? Who cares what your baby daddy's saying? Come on, let's get real here. Who cares what Shanene is saying or Freaky Freddy is saying or Larry Lux me saying? Who cares what people say? You've got to get to the place where you endure some hardship. Endure some hardship. Man up. Somebody came to me this week and they said, such and such and said all this bad stuff about you. Do you want to know what they said? I said, I ain't got time for that. I don't even care. My destiny is too great. What's in front of me is greater than anything that's around me. And I'm going forward. I ain't got time to be caught up in that stuff. I'm enduring hardship. I'm enduring hardship. See, 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 see. Because people will attack you. Life will hit you. They ain't nothing can hit you harder than life. I've told you, one text message can change your life. I told you, one phone call can change your life. One knock on the door, baby, can change your life forever. And you've got to get to the place where you say, I'm going to endure. Your kids will even flip on you. Come on, somebody, your kids. You didn't wipe their butt when they were little, and they flip on you when they get grown. My God, this is good. You got to endure hardship. You ready for this? Sometimes you even feel like God is against you. See, this is just for this is just for a certain group of people. Now I'm getting a little deep now. Sometimes. You feel like even God is against you. Have you ever been there? Because you know he has all power in heaven and earth in his hands. You know that he could just change it with just a word. You know he didn't have to let it happen. You know that everything hits your life is filtered through his fingers anyway. You know that neither death nor life nor angels nor principality is going to separate you from his love. But the truth of the matter is, is that sometimes you feel like God is against you. I remember the apostle Paul, he was crying out and he said, Lord, I asked you three times that this thorn be removed from me. Lord, I know you can take it away. I know you can deliver me, God, from what's happening all around me, God. But the Bible says God doesn't do it, but he says my grace it's sufficient for you. In other words, man up, apostle. In other words, deal with it, apostle. In other words, endure hardship, apostle. Because listen, there's something I'm trying to do in you. A brother texted me this the other day and it's been ministering to me. Sometimes it's not Satan buffeting. Sometimes it's God chiseling. Oh, that was good. Let me say it again. Somebody needs to throw that on Facebook. Listen, sometimes it's not God, it's not the devil buffeting. Sometimes it's God chiseling. It's chiseling. He's chiseling everything that doesn't look like Jesus off your life. And listen, sometimes he'll use your cousin. Sometimes he'll use your granny. Sometimes he'll use your money. Sometimes he'll use your kids. Sometimes he'll use your children. Sometimes he'll use your finances. Sometimes he'll use your job. Sometimes he'll use your boss. Sometimes he'll use your emotions. Sometimes he'll use your flesh. Sometimes he'll use the devil. I want somebody to know here today that you've got to endure some hardship. You know, truthfully, sometimes when people come to me for counseling, I just want to give them two words. Close. 
It's shut up! <laughs> shut up! Stop sniffling about your problems. Everybody going through something. Everybody's going through something. Huh? Going through stuff with your marriage and going through stuff with your money and going through stuff with your kids and going through stuff with your health and going through stuff. And it's time for you to start enjoying some stuff. Away with these messages talking about you're going to come out all the time. Sometimes you don't come out. Y'all aren't ready for that. Y'all aren't ready for that. Sometimes you got to learn to deal with it. Sometimes God doesn't remove the burden. Sometimes God, all he does is just strengthen your shoulder to carry the burden. See, the apostle Paul, here he is, he's stuck like Chuck. He's stuck like Chuck. He's in an orange jumpsuit. He's walking around. He has no visits. He's eating Jack Mack setups. Come on, somebody. Ah. He stopped like Chuck in a wet and damn sick. And he's by himself. Think about that. Hold up, hold up, hold up. You mean he's by himself? Come on. Where's, where's Eutychus? You remember Eutychus? Eutychus, he fell out the window. He died. Jesus raised him up. I mean, uh, uh, the apostle Paul, he raised him up again to life. Where's Eutychus? Eutychus doesn't send him a card. Amen. We don't have no record of that. Amen. Eutychus doesn't bake him a cake and go see him. Amen. Where's Aquila? Where's Priscilla? Amen. Where's Barnabas? Where's Mark? Where are the apostles? Where are all these people who he invested in? Where are all the people that he taught there in Troas? Where's the king of Malta? Where are these people who he healed? Who God used them to heal and God used them to deliver and God used them to speak life through. Where are these people that are supposed to be there for him? This is God's man. He writes 14 books of the New Testament. Where's the church? Where's the church of Corinth? Where are all these people that he itemizes in Romans chapter 16? Where are the people at? It's by himself. Just like Jesus was by himself on the cross. See, I've discovered that the higher up you go, the fewer people that can come with you. And I've discovered, listen, I've discovered, I've discovered that sometimes God will put you in a place that, 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 that you will, that, 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 that sometimes you'll be in a place and that you'll be in a place so low because God is wanting to teach you that he's all you need that he is all you need in that time of crisis in that time of trouble I, I want somebody to understand this today I, I want you to understand that you've got to learn to endure hardness you've got to learn to endure hardness you've got to learn to endure when people forsake you you, you, you've got to learn to endure when, when, unmet, when, when you have expectations of people and those expectations are not met. You, you've got to, listen, you've got to go ahead and resign to yourself that there could be a possibility that no matter how many people you touch in life, there could be a possibility that you might die alone. And you've got to endure hardness. You've got to endure hardness. It's necessary. See, I've discovered Amen. that sorrow is often a greater teacher than pleasure. Amen. That sorrow is often a greater teacher than, than pleasure. It is said this, I walked a mile with pleasure and she chattered all the way but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. Then I walked a mile with sorrow, and not a word said she. But oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. I want you to know that trials are inevitable. I want you to know that obstacles are on the way. I want you to know that sometimes the people that you do the most for won't do even the least for you. I know, I, I know that they told you that they'll never leave you nor forsake you. But the Bible says, let God be true and every man be a liar. I know that they told you that they'll be with you through thick and thin. 
but oftentimes when things get thick, they get thin. And, but I believe what the Apostle Paul wanted to do here in the life of, the, of, of Brother Timothy is he wanted to encourage Timothy that in this world you will have troubles, that in this world you will have tribulations. See, and what he wanted him to understand is that through faith and through courage in the Lord and through understanding God's word, we can go through any crisis, any trouble, any difficulty. Because listen, 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 listen. You should never doubt in the dark what God has told you in the light. Not once in this passage of scripture or that whole entire book does the apostle Paul, he complain, does he bigger, bicker, or does he gripe? He understands that he's already committed himself to the one that is faithful and true. And listen, I would love to end this message, or I would love to end this particular passage of scripture out of 2 Timothy with all these great things happening in the life of Paul there at the end. But if the truth be told, history will say that the apostle Paul, right after he wrote this, he was drunk down the hall in chains and they put his head on a block and they cut it off. And his last words were to the to Timothy to endure hardships. Endure hardships. He didn't say you was coming out of the hardships. He said endure hardships. See this message is foreign here in the United States. Because what we have an idea of, of Christianity is Westernism in the sense of we have to have the house with the picket fence and we have to have the car and we have to have the, we have to have the, the, the six figures in our bank account. And that's the idea of what Christianity is. But listen, according to scripture, that's not the case. Because God will, listen, God will, he will afflict, he will comfort the afflicted, but God will afflict the comforted. He'll afflict the comforted because he doesn't want you to stay in a place of comfort. He wants you to move to a place of destiny. And oftentimes the only way that can happen is when you're persecuted. This is why the Bible says, listen, when you are persecuted, when all men say all manner of evil falsely against you for his name's sake, he said rejoice and be glad in that day. It's through the scriptures where he says this, the apostle Peter, he said, listen, consider it not strange about the fiery trial that's about to try you. In other words, count it all joy. That's what he said when you fall into diverse temptations the apostle Paul he, he summed it all up in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 after God told him that his strength was made perfect in his weakness and he said when I am weak then I am strong and then he said this he said I will most gladly therefore rather glory in my infirmities so that the power of Christ can rest upon me in other words what he wanted to convey to Timothy he's saying you are going to go through some stuff but you need to rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice you need to be reminded that all things are going to work together for good because you love God and you are called according to his purpose you need to be reminded again Timothy that no weapon formed against you is going to prosper and he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world and even though sometimes you might not come out listen to be absent from the body is to be present for the Lord so if they persecute you preach the gospel if they lie on you preach the gospel be instant in season be instant out of season God has not given you a spirit of fear let no man despise your youth. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Believe and receive and walk in it, Timothy. What God has for you is great. Don't you be discouraged. Because listen, I'm not going to tell you everything is going to be all right. I'm telling you trials are going to come. But in the end, baby, we win. There's a crown of life laid up for each and every one of us that are doing the work of the kingdom. You've got to endure Look at your neighbor and say, get some thick skin. <laughs> Who cares if they take your seat at church? Who cares if they don't sing your song? Who cares if they don't do your dance? Who cares if they don't text back? Who cares if they don't like your Facebook post? Who cares if all these things that are going on? Who cares if your car breaks down? Who cares if your marriage might be on the rocks? You've got to get to the place where you endure some stuff. The reason why you act so surprised is because nobody ever told you that. Nobody ever told you that. Huh? You've got to endure. I've told you sometimes you've got to keep swinging the sword with one hand while you're wiping tears with the other, but you can't give up. You've got to endure some stuff. You've got to endure some stuff. The Apostle Paul, he said, if they were with us, if, if, if they were for us, they would still be with us, but they went out. People going to leave you. 
People going, is this too hard for y'all? Kids, you raise up in the faith, they're going to turn their back and might go to the world. What you going to do? They were asking this older gentleman. They had three people in the room. And one was in their, in their 30s. The other one was in their 50s. And the other one was in their 70s. And they said, what's your favorite verse in all the scripture? And then the one that was 30, he said, my favorite verse in the scripture is, give and it shall be given unto me. Press down, shake it together, run it over, shall be in. Give in my bosom. He said, I love that scripture because I'm so financially blessed. And I've been given and God's been blessing me. They asked the one that was 50, they said, what's your favorite verse in the scripture? What, what is your favorite passage that you love in, in, in God's word? And, and, and then they said, the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous can run into it and they are saved. He said, because I had sickness in my body and I ran into the name of the Lord and God, God sheltered me and he watched over me. And they asked the 70 year old, what's the favorite scripture that you have? And he said, my favorite passage in the scripture is where it says, and it came to pass. I said, why do you love that scripture so much? He said, because when I was 30, I had a business that was very, very successful. But when I was 40, I got sick and I lost it all. And when I was 50, I lost sight in one eye. And when I was 60, my wife died. But now that I'm 70, I realize that all of it will come to pass. He said, I realize that I've got to the place now that there is an after this. I've got to the place now where I understand that at the end of the day, God will never leave me, nor he will forsake me. And weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And I've resigned myself to the scripture where it says, though he may slay me, yet I'll still trust in him. I have not bought this pie in the sky idea that everything is going to be hunky-dory, no, or peaches and cream. He said, I believe that out in this world we will have tribulations. He said, but through it all, God is with me. And if God be for me, who can be against me? And no matter what kind of trials, no matter what kind of tribulations, no matter what kind of storms, no matter what kind of heartaches, no matter who betrays me, no matter who lies on me, no matter what my financial situation might be, no matter what kind of obstacles I might face, I know that God is faithful and he is with me. My kids might forsake me, my money might fail, everything in life might fail, but I know that God, he is faithful and I will stand on his word. Come on, clap your hands in this place and jump to your feet all around God's house.